Before I start, I gotta, I gotta say something, Charles. Your daughter did a phenomenal job in that film. That was your daughter, right? Yes, yes it was. Nicole. Your daughter was like two, right? I mean, she was a natural. I don't even think she looked at the camera one time. That yeah. was unbelievable. Well, that, you know, that's also, a, it's a testimony to her, certainly, but, uh, you know, the power of editing, too. She was awesome, though, no matter how you cut it. Yeah, the way we did it, uh, we rehearsed, when I knew I was making the movie, for sure, right. we rehearsed, she and I, uh, how to pretend to be sleeping, as she had to do in, like, two or uh, three scenes, okay. sleeping. And... Um, it's it's an it's an old it's an old maxim from Hollywood. I think W. C. Fields may be uh, attributed as the author of this, but uh, a wise person never makes a film with children or with animals because right, he can't control right. them. Exactly. You know, and they're not they're not really influenced by the inducement of money. It means nothing. Right. So they do what they want to do, and um, so with Nicole, the whole idea, my daughter Nicole, was to keep everything a game. Keep it fun for her. Okay. And there's a scene in the uh, park in the sandbox where there are three little girls yes. playing around. Yes. That day was the day, the first day, we shot for 15 days altogether. Okay. Um, we went one day over schedule. We planned to do it for 14, but we shot 15 days because the camera broke. We were shooting in eight degree weather, basically. It. So it was really, really rough. And that day was day number nine. And the little girls in the sandbox, they all started to cry. They just didn't want to be there. Uh oh. And um, here I was like, we've come this far, and these little knuckleheads are going to ruin my movie. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And there was nothing I could do about it. And they, you know, when one cries, you know, most of you, some of you, I would imagine, are parents. And if you get your kids a play date, whatever, when one cries, the other one, you know, has to join in. They become a little symphony. And um, mm. I didn't, you know, I didn't know what to do. And then finally, someone came up with the idea: uh, the stomach, M and M's, and popcorn. So if you watch the scene ever again, you'll notice that the little girls are constantly, and we kept them yeah, happy, yeah. constantly eating. So. Okay. Now, now I read that when you showed this film at the Cannes Film Festival, there was a 12-minute standing ovation, which I think set a record, which is extremely impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also look at the film uh, uh, closely. I think I saw some familiar faces. I think I saw Darnell Williams. Right? Darnell Williams, indeed, yeah. And Edie Falco. Was Edie Falco in there from The Sopranos? Am yeah, I right? Edie Falco from The Sopranos. She's in the, uh, near the last scene in the horse and buggy. Right. The, the kissing couple. Yeah, and I thought uh, she looked, and I also saw an uh, uh, actor I see on Martin Lawrence, Luis Ramos. I Louis, think I see him. He was in Do, Do the Right Thing, too, right? Yeah, Do Louis the Right Ramos, Thing, one of the Hispanic uh, the right thing. actors. And he's my good friend. We went to college together. Oh, wow. And Edie Falco went to the same school as well. See, you find out something every day. Um, making a film like that is challenging. Was it, was it always meant to be a silent film? Did you, was, it, was it always, was it, was it budgetary that you did that, or was it just conscious? Because it, it really echoes a lot of Charlie Chaplin. I mean, obviously, anybody who knows film can see a lot of the echoes of the silent, great films in your work. Was that a conscious decision, or was that something that was something that just happened to work out like that? I don't know. I'm playing, I'm playing. It totally <laughs> was, it totally was a conscious uh, uh, decision. Um, I'll start by saying, this was made in 1989 when I was in college in 1976. Wow. Uh, because of a, I wanted to challenge myself as a, as a filmmaker. Um, initially, I just loved hardware and technology, mm -hmm. color, such like that. And you know, when you're a film major, you have to study the history of film. You have to go back mm. into uh, the silent era. You know, German cinema, uh, cinema cinematic expression, mm -hmm. um, post you know, nihilism, and such like that. Uh, so we had to study silent films, and I really resented it. I thought it was kind of a waste of my time, and, and it, it did nothing for me. And then in 19, this is 1973, 74, mm. 1976, I decided to, um, to really uh, challenge myself and try to make a film combining all of the elements that I pretty much resented in filmmaking. I really didn't like silent movies at all. I didn't think black and white had a place anymore in the, in the modern 70s. Um, comedy to me at the time was a, a lesser form, a lesser genre than was uh, drama and, and social commentary. Um, 
And slapstick, I thought, was kind of beneath intellect and uh, the written word of, mm. of wit and such like that. So I decided to make a silent movie and figured that if I did it well, um, that would make me stronger, you right, know, build absolutely. the muscles, and I wouldn't ever have to fucking do it again. You know? <laughs> oh, God. Right. So that was the idea. Um, so I did it, and in the process of, of, of studying Keaton and Kaplan and, and Hal Lloyd, you know, I start, started to see that these guys were artists and these guys were doing things that filmmakers, you know, modern-day filmmakers could not dream of doing. That's right. So I uh, started to fall in love with the genre somewhat, and um, you know, the idea in the short film is called The Place in Time, and that's 1976. So the idea was to see if I can step it up a little bit. Most silent, well, virtually all silent films um, have what they call intertitles, and that is the characters are, not subtitles at the bottom, but intertitles, so characters are speaking to one another, and one goes like, right, and the other one goes, and then, the image would stop and you would read what they both said. And those are called intertitles. They're in titles interrupting the right, flow of right, the action. Right. So the one thing in 1976 I said, well, I'm doing a silent film. Who's doing a film that doesn't speak in 1976? But if I'm going to do it, then I won't have intertitles. I'll try to really make it totally visual mm -hmm. with an original uh, soundtrack. Mm -hmm. And how did you guys like the music, by the way? And yeah, the music <laughs> definitely worked. Yeah. That was uh, the wonderfully gifted Mark Martyr, another purchase friend of mine. But um, he uh, is just brilliant. And when we started, he didn't know anything about writing music. He was a music major, writing music for a film. I mean, he was studying everything else except writing, writing music for film. That's not really uh, a vocation uh, at purchase at the school that I went to at right. the time. So I told him that I knew everything about it, in which I knew a good deal about it. But I have no talent for writing music, I mean, please. So uh, I said, together we can build a Frankenstein monster. You'll be the monster, I'll be Frankenstein. That was the idea. So we studied, uh, I, I took him to many movies, different styles, mm -hmm. studied motifs and, and, and uh, thematics for characters. And the thing about my silent movie before, and this one especially, is that Music in film in general, the, the speaking film, it's considered background music, right? It's, so the actors are doing their things, and in the background is the, mm. is the music. Mm -hmm. But in a silent film, it's not background, it's foreground. It's the dialogue. It That's speaks right. for the individual character. So, um, you know, I was giving him lessons in uh, how to do uh, themes, how to back off of a theme and do an overall umbrella theme for the movie, and specifics and Mickey Mousing, which is a term that comes from Hollywood in the old days, cartoons. Um, used to have, and still do to a large degree, music that uh, apes and mimics exactly what the cartoon characters are doing. And so Mickey Mouse being one of the most famous uh, mm -hmm. cartoons, uh, if he would go, go to a, a stove and open a stove and burn his hand, you would hear something like, doop, 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 you know, and that's called Mickey Mouse and running down the stairs, a cartoon, like that. So there's, there, there are places in that for a silent film like this, but you can't do it much. You, it's called a sting. So you have to back off of the specific hits and do the overall. So uh, to answer your question, this is a long-winded answer. Yes, Good it answer. was by design, definitely. Wonderful. Um, you're one of the few people that made a, a student film that, I know you also won a Student Academy Award at, at, at one point as well, that ended up getting you into the, the Hollywood system. And I think it's important for people that are here that are into the film industry for you to just to tell a little bit of how this film led to doing a film with a major studio like Touchstone and how your experience was going from making something completely independent, your own vision, you being a star, catalyst of the film of your own right, to working within a Disney corporation, getting that coveted studio opportunity how was that good, bad, and, and was it a hard transition, and how did it, you know, tell them exactly what you want to tell them about that experience, working with a studio, going from being independent? Okay, well, how much time do you have? Tell what you want. Okay. This is like, we need this, this is stuff that people need to hear. The studio system is no joke. Okay, I'll try to do it, like, within a, a, the parameters of uh, half a night, half a night, so just settle in, we're going to be here for a while. No, I'll do it in, <laughs> I'll do it in five minutes, I promise. Um, <laughs> Uh, 
when I made this film, it, it was uh, it made a big noise internationally. We did show it in Cannes. Mm. It did get a 12 minute standing ovation, and that was all good. We then sold the movie to Island Pictures. That's Chris Blackwell, the company that did that. You know, represented Bob Marley and just a lot of people. Did they do She's Got to Have It too? Did they release She's Got to Have It? Did it do Spike Lee's film She's Got to Have It? Island they Pictures? did She's Got to Have It. That was the first one. And Jim Jarmusch, the other independent filmmaker, they did his um, it, Down by Law, Strange Down by and, and Strange and in Paradise. Got it. So I thought I was in good hands, indeed. And they bought the film, and you know, we made a profit in the sale, and so on and so forth. Um, Disney, uh, well, first off, with, with Island Pictures, I had a three-picture deal, basically. So Disney liked sidewalk stories. They had a project called True Identity, a, pro a project that they um, couldn't quite get off the ground. The script was never, never right. It was you know, a bit offensive. It's basically about a, a black actor who, through circumstances, has to uh, save his life and survive by masquerading, but you know, circumstantially in uh, white face makeup until he can get, get clear, clear his name and such like that. Um, a little more, it sounds a little weird now, but you know, the way in which it was meticulously const uh, constructed, it makes more sense on the screen than what I'm saying now. But anyway, they couldn't get this off the ground and having seen Sidewalk Stories, they uh, decided that I was the guy for them to do this movie and I wanted no part of it uh, for a number of reasons I wanted to make, to, continue to do independent films, to have control. And at that time, especially Disney, this is 1989, 1990, Disney was really known, had a big reputation for interfering with directors. And I mean, hmm. I'm an independent director, and especially then at the time, but I'm talking about real directors. No, they would just you know screw around with them and, and, and be dictatorial. So that didn't turn me on at all. I mean, if I were going to work for a Hollywood studio, Disney would not be my first choice. Okay. But they uh, kept throwing money at me, and this is where the story gets uh, wonderful and then sad. But they, um, they were throwing money at me in terms of uh, inducing me to do the movie, and I, di I didn't want any part of it, as I said. And finally, in my agent, I had an agent at William Morris, and um, they were saying, Charlie. And they hit me with something that actually made some sense at the time. They said, Charles, it's, um, you should do this film, do it well, and if you do it well, you'll be proud of it. Get the money, get the money, um, and then you'll be in a position of, uh, you'll be stronger, and then you can do mostly anything you want. But do the film, it made sense. And to me, it made strategic sense as well, but Disney needed to hit my number financially before I would even consider it. So about two weeks into, like, we want you to do the film, I don't want to do it, they hit my number pretty much, and I was like, oh, fuck, man, I really got to do this thing. Right. And. Um, it wasn't pleasant, and I just said, okay, well, I can make the transition. It's just on a bigger level. It's independence, but I will probably be fighting with these guys a lot. So as it turns out, I was fighting with these guys a lot, and um, mm. it was a lot of second guessing and a lot of uh, making the film by committee. Um, because they, they, they were more formulaic. They knew I was independent. They knew uh, paying me an amount of money that they did, uh, and the film was budgeted at $16 million, which wow. was a lot of dough in that day. Uh, Sidewalk Stories was only 200000 to wow. do this feature film, mostly exteriors on the street, as, as you saw. But True Identity was $16 million, and so they knew, without telling me, of course, but they knew they had to keep me in line. They knew that I had an aggressively independent spirit. So in order to try to fuse my DNA with uh, their necessities, which was to make a Hollywood kind of co cookie cutter film, you know, not too edgy, um, they knew they had to keep an eye on me and therein lied all of our conflicts. Mm. You know? um, so there were times that I, that I wanted to quit, but I was like halfway through and such like that. It wasn't pleasant at all. What was pleasant was you know, being financially, uh, the financial remunerations, they, they, you know, that kind of made it okay for a while. But I wasn't able to get my total vision in for this movie. So there are moments in True Identity that have social comedy as the sidewalk stories. It's a, the film you just saw is, um, you know, considered a comedy. We're laughing in the beginning, but it's little by little, mm -hmm. um, social commentary comes in and it's speaking about uh, the homeless situation in New York City, and then by the time you get towards the end, there's no comedy whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, so my, my, my experience in word at Disney was not pleasant. The money was great. So if the budget was, you say, $16 million, yeah. how much did Disney expect that film to gross if they, did they want it to gross 40, 50? What would have been a number that they would have been happy with coming back to you and saying, we're pleased with the return on yeah. this investment? I actually asked them and they said if it was, um, how did they phrase it? They put it in baseball metaphors. Uh, so it was, um, if we can get like a, you know, a first base hit, a strong first base hit, like say 30 million, something like that, that we would be happy. If we got a double, happier still. If we got a grand slam, and the grand slam was about $70 million, if they got that, like you would be king of Hollywood, you know, right. for, for a little while, I'm sure. But that was the deal. So True Identity actually grossed, I think, under $10 million. Okay. And that was, that was it, you know, so my star, which was uh, rising up with the potentiality of, mm -hmm. of a three picture deal and, and writing my own, uh, signing my own checks as it were, uh, turned. And so I was back to um, uh, trying to do good, strong, independent films. And that's mm -hmm. always a struggle to find money. Um, you know, and I did a few in between. I did a, a Hollywood movie with Mario Van Peebles. Oh, yeah, Posse. Posse. As an actor, which is not the thing I like to do most. Right. It's, Directing and editing is my thing, but um, yeah. Uh, excellent answer, and very I um, appreciate your honesty. I wanna I wanna open the floor up while we have some time. The people I think it's important for the audience uh, to to have some questions. If you have a question for Mr. Lane, while we're honored to have him here this evening, please raise your hand, and, and our founder of Real Black, Mike Dennis, will give you the microphone, and you will definitely get in. Outstanding and honest answer from Mr. Charles Lane, pioneer filmmaker from the 90s. Say um, your name first too, man, please. Sure, um, Essence, I'm wondering, um, spending so much time without words, I mean, what did you walk away with? I mean, a different appreciation, I'm imagining you walked away with a different appreciation for words, and if so, could you just speak to that? Uh, about words, did you say, or work? Words. Words, yeah. Well. Um, I, you know, I, I, I initially, and still to this day, I believe you know, vehemently in the written word. I believe in that. Uh, but I knew, having done the short film and having gotten some international uh, positive responses for a film that was 34 minutes long, I knew that there was something in uh, doing a silent film and doing it well, you know, if, if I could do that, if I could meet that challenge. What was challenging for me was the fact that I did it successfully for 34 minutes, and now with this movie, it's a feature length film. One understood that um, if you did it well, it would be potentially a phenomenon, it would be a thing. Once people accepted that it wasn't going to speak, uh, if, you can, if you could find that audience base, and if you could find people to really like, whoa, this is a different film, it would be something that hadn't been seen f for years and old becomes new again, basically. So I understood that possibility. I also understood that if you have a few false notes in this thing, you're done. You, you know, like what the hell were you trying to do? Why would you even do that? So it was a tightrope for me, but I had done it in a short film, so I knew I could do it, but I didn't know if I could sustain it for an hour and a half. Um, that was the thing. and so. When we showed it in Cannes, the premiere, and getting a 12-minute standing ovation, it was like, maybe I got something here, you know? And the reviews were great when it came out, and 25 years later, it's been restored, and you know that's why you're seeing it now, but it's been in theaters around the country, and the reviews were even better than they were in 1989. That's 25 years. Uh, so to answer your question more succinctly, I think that uh, my, my understanding of visual, it's about blending, my understanding of the power of visual cinema, uh, as Hitchcock speaks to it, about pure cinema. And as Billy Wilder, the, the, the great filmmaker, mm -hmm. is a big proponent of wit and the words, and Lubitsch, the spoken word, and comedy, or drama, um, my sensibility, I believe, is a bit more keen than it was before I made Sidewalk Story. So I understand the power of both and I understand the power of blending them and having potentially the best of both worlds. Excellent. Yes, I, I wanted to share my thanks also. Uh, my name is Regan, my background's in law and policy. And the first film that was just, that was the, uh, the short that preceded you. Yeah. Uh, a long walk. 
it, it had a very clear nexus to policy and the, the filmmaker actually was, uh, is in the process of actually showing it in schools and that kind of thing. My question is, uh, does this film, which was also has a clear policy nexus with homelessness and other things, um, has there ever been any push to, um, to, 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 in a very frontal way, embrace that, showing it at different conferences, government agencies, what have you, uh, anything that's relevant to that policy uh, nexus? Um, not so much. And when we, uh, you know, when I made the film and uh, before we sold it to Ireland, uh, I had a little proviso that I couldn't enforce, but it was like that I want it to, um, I want part, I want part of the proceeds to go to uh, the betterment of homeless people as a fund and such like that. And I was given some yes, but we still have to recoup our money. We still have to make money. And I said, well, yeah, after that, but it was a naive thing on my part. Um, there have been a few organizations, like the ones you speak of, that had screenings. Um, in England, uh, this is going to be showing in London, uh, I think September, and not only in a venue like this with a screen, but it's going to be um, uh, shown to different sects of uh, homeless organizations that they're going to do fundraisers and all, and much more actively in September in London than it ever has happened here. So I'm pleased about that. But no, it wasn't enough done, in my opinion, along those lines. I gotta say, um, his question brings up a quick point before we go on. Um, the economy today is, is, is not in a good shape. That's why I think that the brother makes a good point because the message of your film in 2014 is just as relevant today than it was in 1989. Thank you. And I love the fact that it's colorblind. Like, when I, after a while, I look at your film, I don't see color. I don't see a black man taking care of a young black. It's just, I just see people. That's it's very humane. Thank you. And I think that that's the reason why you have places like London or other, because the, your message, your film is a very universal humanity. And when the, when the gentleman has to return the, the daughter back, you know, it, it's, it's, it's painful to watch because, you know, he was really, you could tell he really loved the little girl and, and it, it, it's, it's been some powerful stuff. I think that message today is very applicable to people. Mike, keep going. Whoever, I don't know who's next. I'm sorry for interjecting. Charles, thank you very much. I didn't see the film in 89, so I'm very honored to be able to see it 25 years later as a new 25 print. years, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you for sharing it on, with us all again. Uh, your study of silent cinema has come through beautifully and you've expressed it. And I wonder uh, when you knew you had the face, the face of a man that I would have empathy for and care for and take this journey with. Because it's all about the face, in, as you well know. In silent film, the face is a typish. It, it, com it conveys so much. When did you know you had the face for this guy? That's a good question. Um, the truth is, I never knew. I was confident that I might have been close, having done the short film that I mentioned, A Place in Time, and garnering the success from that movie, I thought to myself, yeah, you may have the face, but don't count your chickens, you know, because you're now embarking to do a film three times the length. And that face may become very wearisome mm -hmm. by one hour, by the one hour, hour mark, and uh, you may be run out of town on the rails. So I never really knew or considered that I got the fucking face. No, never, never that. It's always a challenge. It's always um, some degree of vulnerability and uh, the, 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 the pervasive question, what if? What if I don't, dot, 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 you know, that kind of thing. So I'm not speaking for myself, you know, some filmmakers, but I think for the most part I'm correct in saying, even the great Alfred Hitchcock, the great Charlie Chaplin, filmmakers and artists at moments in quiet, they know that they, they know what they're doing, they know that this is powerful, they know this is their vision, they know that um, this is the best they can do, and if, again, if things go well, the world may love it, but those same artists have had passionate projects that they've done and no one understood it. Uh, people like, how could you do this? And it's like, you know, you ask many filmmakers, contemporary or, or, or from before, and they'll say the film I love most is maybe this little thing that never saw the light of day, you know, that never made a dollar. Um, and so artists on painters, what have you, songwriters, music, you, most of the time you don't know crap. 
you just know what you feel, you just know that it can work, you just know that you hopefully do the best you can, and the rest of it is opportunity, luck, chance, this, that, and the other. But you can hedge your bets a little bit. And so, honestly, when I made this film, uh, there were many things I wanted to do with it. I wanted the, the, the word blend comes to mind because I was mixing genres to some degree. I was making a social commentary film about homelessness uh, that was a comedy, that was slapstick, that was you know just full of, hopefully, humor and such like that. Um, I knew that if I put a really good score to it, um, that that might work. But I understood from day one that I was handicapped. I didn't have words. Most people can't tolerate that. Most people, I'm, I'm being general, I'm generalizing here. I'm generalizing, and as the old joke goes, he's not an army man generalizing. But let, let that pass. I, um, Thank you. I um, um, knew that I was handicapped. I knew that it can become very, very boring after five minutes. So I never knew the face, the film, the subject matter. I didn't know. But I was constantly trying to compensate to make the whole mosaic um, palatable or better. And um, so. Well, you know what? His point is good, though. Speaking of the face, the female you played against, she, she did a fine job, too. She did a wonderful she job. She carried a lot of your film. I mean, you definitely were outstanding, but the female actress, she, she did a fine, she had some comedic moments, she had some serious moments, she had, she had a great palette too. Where did you find her? Is she still acting today? Is, I mean, what, who was she? Uh, her name is Sandy Wilson, Sandy Wilson, and um, I knew her you know, on a friendly basis um, about three, four years before I did the movie. And uh, you know she's a theater actress by and large. Um, she's done some small independent films. But speaking of the face, when I knew I was going to make this movie, um, I didn't. I was looking for a leading lady. I said to myself, quite honestly, but she has to have the face. You know, for me, I can tell you about my insecurities about it because the whole thing is about what I bring to it and what who I cast. They say casting is ninety percent of making a movie. So I and hello. So I understood that. Um, you know, a lot of it relied on, on what I designed, how I executed it, so on, blah, blah, blah. But I thought, I knew that I had to have a strong leading lady, and I knew that she had to run the gamut of emotions and comedy and, you know, feeling sorrow for the, the artist character that I play. Uh, you know, when things get bad for him, being sensitive to the little girl, blah, blah, blah. So, um, I was at, in Penn Station in New York, and, uh, Walking, uh, walking for subway, and I see Sandy, my old friend, you know, for four years that I haven't seen in about a year or so. And she's sitting there, waiting for the train. And I was like, "Wait a minute, she's an actress. She has the face. Let me approach her." And I told her, "Listen, I want you to come audition for me. I'm doing a film. Really, Charlie? Yeah, I got the money to do a film. It's different. It's a silent film, and so on." So we auditioned her. She knocked it out of the ballpark, and the rest is history. So she's, she's wonderful. She now is um, doing more writing. You know, mm. She's acting a little bit, you know, few and far between, but more writing. And uh, she's a poet, and she has the face and the ability. Excellent. Sir, yeah. please. I want to preface what I... I'm over here. Oh, hello. I want to... Thank you. Uh, I want to preface what I'm going to say by saying I picked up Leonard Maltin's... Uh, compendium of, of film critiques. You know, it's like A to Z, mm -hmm. every film, well, not everyone, but it, it's up to 2003. And he gives, he, he gives sidewalk stories, three stars, and it, it does the uh, synopsis and says, this, you must see this gem. And that was this afternoon, and I thought, oh, well, okay, I guess that tags me. I gotta go see this gym. So now I'm looking at this film, and, and now we get to the end, and I'm thinking, you really, have ha you really had to have had an eye on <coughs> shooting that scene. Where is that in Manhattan? All I know is that there's a building across from that little park area, and signs in the window say, crazy, 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 Eddie. 
And it brought back the memory of, because Crazy Eddie is insane. That's right. That's and right. it kind of was like a, an overarching image of all the action that's going on. You know, the raving guy, the people bumming change, the guy asking for cigarettes, and then all that action of people going by and ignoring. And, and it was, it really kind of, just, it, was, it just tied a bow in, in, you know, in, in, in that package that you presented. Because it was just, everything went well together, everything. Wow. Well, thank you. That, that's that's uh, very, very, very cool. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. The, um, the, ear, the location that we shot that was called Liberty Park. Now, the name has been, maybe some of you recognize it. It's been, it's now called Zakoti uh, or Zakati Park. And this is where um, the whole Wall Street sit-in and that whole rebellion happened. And um, a few audiences that I, uh, that I was in front of seeing the film, they were like, Zakoti Park, Zakoti Park, how did you know? And I said, I didn't know. These are, <laughs> I didn't know. These are circumstances. And just fortuitously, um, it, 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 it brings on a different political life that I never, of course, could have ever anticipated. But um, that's what it was called, Liberty Park. And that name, um, for me, had meaning at the time, in 1989, Liberty Park. But yeah, it's the Cody Square. Yeah. We got another question here in the front, sir. Yes. I really, really enjoyed this. Uh, it seemed to be filmmaking at a very high level. And uh, I think you really accomplished a lot, as many people have already said. It got me thinking, as did an article that was in our newspaper yesterday about the film The Artist that was out a couple of years ago. Clearly there are some parallels. Um, and that got me thinking, how widely seen was this film in 1989? Mm, how I mean, I, how widely seen was this film in 1989? Mm. I vaguely knew of it, but I don't remember it playing here. Uh, I see a lot of movies. Mm. I might have missed it, but yeah. that's, that's my question. Well, um, the answer is that it was seen internationally in a lot of territories, including Japan, uh, Switzerland, uh, Italy, England, London, France especially. Um, throughout the United States, uh, it hit all of the major cities and some smaller cities I never even heard of. But uh, it was a limited release. Um, Island Pictures at the time, and I'm not, you know, I'm not speaking out of school here, but Island Pictures at the time was going through a transition when uh, they were handling my movie. That transition is that they were independent mm -hmm. and smallish, mm -hmm. but had um, enough money in their distribution arm to push a film that they believed in, uh, like She's Gotta Have It, like the Jim Jarmusch film that I mentioned earlier. But what happened in 1989 was that Chris Blackwell hired two young guys, two young Turks to be his presidents, co-presidents. I won't name them, but their name is Mark Berg and Chris Sarpis, right? <laughs> so um, they had a whole different vision for Ireland. Okay. They wanted Ireland to be what Miramax was, like bigger, doing bigger films and such like that. Sidewalk stories to them, mm -hmm. but they was straddled with this because Chris Blackwell loved the film and wanted them to do their job, but for them, they wanted to get rid of it as soon as possible, basically, mm. and, um, and go on to the new, bigger thing. Um, one film that one of the presidents really wanted to do, and he was approached by the filmmakers, and he wanted to do it, but Chris and the money you know, forbade it, was um, uh, Dances with Wolves, for example. Um, and another company did that. It might have been Warner Brothers, do you yeah. know, was it? Or was it Orion? Orion, yeah. It was Orion. Orion. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, so that's what they were looking towards. And so, yeah, my film was widely seen international, internationally, but limited. So um, it would play in a theater perhaps for like a week. It hardly ever got two weeks of play. It wasn't pushed. And there was some, like in Chicago, for example, there was a little bit of a groundswell of people wanting to see the film but a print was not available because mm. they struck, I think, 17 prints as opposed to like 30. And so they couldn't service some of the markets at the time that the markets were ready to embrace it. And so it was kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, you know, fucked up. Um, 
And that's, that's the story. But yes, it was seen around the world, and I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that. Well, I'm going to tell you, we, we're proud of you, and I think I just want to give people some time, since Mike was kind of to get those sidewalk stories, posters. I want people to have the chance to talk to you and get you to sign this personally. This is an honor for all of us. Please, let's give Mr. Lane another round of applause for coming down here and engaging us. Wonderful. Mike, you want to say a couple of closing things here before we... A couple of things. Well, it did play here in Philadelphia at the Roxy. Oh, uh, the Roxy, my God. But I was in New York when that happened. Um, I, I just want to thank Rel. Give him a big round of applause for moderating this Q&A. And once again, uh, Charles, for coming down and being a part of this tonight. It's a very special night for us. Um, this is, we, we'll be doing shows throughout the summer at 40th and Lancaster. I hope you'll join our mailing list. Um, there is uh, the best jerk chicken in the city. James Siler Road Jerk Chicken just got a write-up. Uh, Drew Laser in the Daily News um, is like one of the, uh, Philly's best kept secrets, so please ah. sample that. Um, and uh, we'll be back here in this space. Well, I'll be back here next, uh, on the 2nd, with Debbie Allen. Um, we're also, we also have a show on Friday uh, at Philly Cam with, uh, with Derek and uh, uh, Josh Duncan screening, and that's on the website. And then also um, uh, Brian Bazemore, wave your hand, just raise your hand. He's the star of another short film that's in the Philadelphia Independent Film Festival on Saturday. So if you're on the mailing list, I'll send that information out. And we'll be back here September 30th for the 30th anniversary of Purple Rain. And we'll be doing that screening. We're gonna, we have a lot of cool things planned for that. Will so. Prince be here for that in March Day? And I'm trying to get somebody. Um, right. You know, we may. We'll, Jerome. We'll, we'll definitely be skyping somebody in. We'll definitely be skyping somebody, and we'll make it worth your experience. But thanks again for being a part of this night. Get your poster signed, please. Yeah, definitely grab, get a poster. And when does when what are, um, when does what are you doing now? And when does this come out on DVD? Oh, wow, good question. Well, okay. Uh, Second question first. Uh, it comes out on DVD, as I understand it, uh, in the States in August, I believe. Okay, and Blu-ray as well. And in France and other European uh, countries, it comes out in September, I think. Yeah. And what am I doing now? I'm here with you fine people, which is a, a, a joy uh, to behold. But I'm also doing a screenplay. I, well, I finished a screenplay, and I'm hoping to make a film, an independent film, yes, uh, called Yellow Tape, which is oh, right. a, a speaking film, color, and it's also, the challenge there is that it's a mixed genre film, so it's a, let's see if I can do this, it's a dramatic comedy, uh, romantic, uh, social commentary, murder mystery. All right. <laughs> right on, thank you folks. Please, get your poster sign. Melody says, Ronnie Laws, Thursday, July 3rd, 2014. Jazz great Ronnie Laws takes the stage at the Hard Rock Cafe.